Okay. Hello. The seats up the front here don't feel like you've got to sit at the back. So, yeah, we've got we a few seats here. So come on, come on down, as they say, on The Price is Right. <laughs> Come on down, we've got a few seats left at the front here. Okay, so I resolved the question about the in class enrollment uh, by visiting our department after class last Thursday, and it turns out the official capacity of this room is 38 seats, and since we didn't have 38 seats last time, that's why we couldn't sit everybody down. However, when we have the first exam, the midterm exam, we're going to have to have 38 seats, so um, we have to have the capacity to have the students in here. So there's a waiting list for the class for those who have applied in it already. Um, and one person has dropped, so there you go. <laughs> Anybody else want to drop, do so quickly, because there's other people who want to get in. Um, so you should have received this morning an email from our um, central administration asking you to join the RQIS organizational account. Who got this email? Yes, all right. Good. So now you respond and you say, yes, I want to join. And you give yourself a username and a password. It's good to use your email address as your username, among other things that's easy to remember. What's critical about this is that you have to stick to the same email address. You can't just have a second email address or another one. That email address that I sent to you is your official address for this class, and it's, that's the address that's used in registering you in the organizational account. You can't have another. So it has to be the same email address. Um, that you're using in the organizational account is what you were sent the invitation for. Once you've got that invitation, then I've put on the class website a set of instructions on how to use ArcGIS Pro, or how to get the software. Actually, it's here called ArcGISUser.pdf. Um, and I understand the students at Utah State University are already, Dr. Tarbert has taken care of them, so uh, they can uh, just follow along here a little bit, perhaps. Uh, so the software at UT Austin is accessible at this location, which is in the UT box. So our central administration, which is actually in the College of Liberal Arts, has set the software up. There's a whole series of versions here. We're going to use the most recent one, which is called ArcGIS Pro 2.2. Uh, when you go to the UT box, you should log in with your U UT EID and password. And when you do that, you can then click on the folder and you can get access inside that in the folder that you're um, going to look, the file that you're going to get is this one, RQIS Pro 22 blah 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 dot exe. So there are a number of others there, but uh, I don't think that you uh, need to use them. There is a help system there, which, David, did you have the, just this top file, or do you, did you use the help system as well? We just got the top file. Yeah, okay. So, um, the, the, in any case, the software is the top file. So, uh, you can you just get this file, download it, it's about a gig, uh, and then you say install, and obviously you have to have install permission on your computer to do that, um, and then you can uh, open up ArcGIS Pro. Um, it doesn't take very long to do that. Uh, when you do that, you'll see at the top right-hand corner something that says like this, not signed in, so it says HTTPS www.archgis.com sign in. When you do that, you'll get presented with this screen, and I think for the first time that you sign in, it's helpful to uh, use this option that says Enterprise Account. And what that means is that you're then signaling that your version of the software is associated with the University of Texas at Austin. That legitimizes you as a, that it'll check the file to say, yeah, you're a real person and you're really an uh, authorized person to use the software and so on. There is no license key for the software. This is how you get in. Um, and when you do that, you then have to fill out uh, what um, organization that you belong to, which is UT-Austin, which goes in this little space here. And then you have to fill out the um, organizational uh, username and password that you have already had to have established. In other words, you've got to establish this first before you can get the software. The first thing is respond to the invitation that you got, get this, get the get your username and password set up, then you can get the software, then you sign in here, and once that happens, then you're, you get this happy message at the top right-hand corner, actually not left, as it's shown here, like, you're in, you know, now you're okay, and you can create a new project and do all kinds of things. 
So this software does not work on Macintoshes. So sad to say, those who have Macintoshes, this ain't a Mac system. This is for a PC, so you have to be able to have a dual boot on your Mac to use Windows. It only operates under Windows. Um, it requires a fair amount of compute resources, so if you've got a really old machine, um, maybe time to upgrade, yes, or you can use our lab. So we have a lab on the second floor at ECJ. Software is already loaded there. Uh, you can just go and, once you've got your username and password, uh, you can sign in and you're, you're clean. It's, you don't have to use your own software at all, but this is how to get it if you don't already have it. Okay, any questions about that? Yes. Uh, so you're talking about the computer lab? Yes. Has, does it have an also? Yes, it does. Yes, I mean, they're all the same access, the same access is provided to them. Ah, can you use it on multiple devices? That's a good question. David, what do you think about that? Um, well, I think you can use it on multiple PCs. I really doubt that it'll work on a phone. Um, <laughs> so it'll probably work on a, a, a Windows tablet. I doubt it'll work on an iPad. So, I mean, yeah, I think I it's, I, it's devices good. that are running Windows. It's yeah, I, what you've got. I don't think that should be a problem, but I, you know, I can't say for sure, you know, so I haven't tried that myself, yes. The lab on the second floor, uh -huh. is it, do you need a, a key or a it To get there after hours, yes. So you should apply for it. They have a little magnetic card thing that you can swipe over the, um, over the entrance. And you can, you can apply to the, mm -hmm. the proctors to get that. Any other questions? Okay, so this is, so we're going to have our first exercise starting on Thursday. So if you can before Thursday, get a hold of the software one way or another, um, that would be helpful so that you can log in and we can get started on that. Uh, today we're going to talk about how to use ArcGIS as a, um, as a software and I've written a synopsis which I put on the course website this morning which is a summary of what we're going to cover in the lecture today. So you can look through that. Um, I've linked here the set of videos to Dr. Maitland, could you uh, minimize the little Adobe Connect thing on the bottom right of your screen, because that's I, showing up as a black box. I'm, I'm, I apologize. Okay, how's that? There you go. Okay. Perfect. Uh, <coughs> so there's a synonymous here, uh, there's a, sorry, a synopsis here uh, that you can read over after class. And, try to consolidate the main points that we've covered while we're having lecture today. And so today we're going to talk about the main forms of the software that we're going to use in this class, which are ArcGIS Pro. So you're going to be pro users, yay ha, yeah, not just wussy ArcGIS users. Um, and actually there is some significance to that because uh, there is a previous system called Arc well, I just regular ArcGIS that is really accessed through ArcMap, and it has Arc Catalog and Arc Toolbox as separate systems. And until uh, 2015, we used that software in this class, and many people still do. It's still a widely used standard. Um, but in 2016, ESRI introduced this system, ArcGIS Pro, and it's the ramp for the future. So for the last two years and this year, uh, we're going to use ArcGIS Pro. Now. The software accesses much the same functionality, it's just that this is a more modernized way of doing it. Uh, we're going to also use a lot the ArcGIS Spatial Analyst. Dr. Tarbotin is an expert on that and we'll come to that a little bit later in this lecture. And the Pro provides access to the ArcGIS Online uh, mapping software, which you can actually use to create maps without any software at all if you want, but more importantly for us, it provides access to data and maps and processing functions that are not intrinsic to the software itself, but which you access as services. So this is a, a new development in GIS, is the idea of GIS on the web. I remember this came out just when the iPad became um, uh, popular. And I was at the Esri user conference and I was just like absolutely stunned when Jack started talking about the, the power of the web. This is about 10 years ago. I don't know how long the iPad's been out, but anyway. So I, I sent my... Uh, um, I assist, assistant a, uh, an email from inside the Ezra user conference, get me an iPad now. <laughs> and, but, it, and, but what was interesting about that was it took 
it's taken about 10 years to mature. This is not something that happened overnight. So the idea of GIS on the web wasn't something that just you know, happened like that. It took quite a long time to mature, and what you're seeing now is a much more mature system than what existed when it was first started out. This is a little, uh, a few pictures about Jack Dangerman, and if you want to see something about his background, there's a, an article there about how he started off working in a nursery and is run by his father, and how he tries to run his business like a nursery and a few things like that, which is kind of cool. He says that managing a large organization is like playing jazz. You know, you sort of, everybody sort of riffs in and riffs out, and you, know, you try to get everybody in tune. Yeah, it's an interesting guy. Uh, interesting organization, too, very flat. And this is the uh, reference to the science of where to the Esri user conference that I uh, gave. I sent out an email about this before the beginning of class, and I think Dr. Tarberton has done also. So you can get a sense of the organization. I remember the first time I went to this conference, and Jack gets up there and he starts talking, and then he said, uh, well, now I think we, we're going to pause and we're going to introduce ourselves to somebody next to each other. And like at church, you know, when you sort of introduce yourself and say, you know, all blessings or whatever. And I thought, whoa, you know, I'm not at the American Society of Civil Engineers anymore. <laughs> but anyway, this is all about relationships. Okay, uh, and this is one of Jack's slides that I really like, and it has to do with um, how you build from data uh, to mapping to integration and into sharing and collaboration. And at this time last year, while we were going through Harvey, I was watching this happening right in front of my eyes. So we were at the State Operations Center, um, you know, rain was pouring down, <laughs> and they built an RTIS online platform for sharing and collaboration of information inside the State Operations Center while the hurricane was going on. Would have been nice if we'd had it actually beforehand, but anyway, it was what it was. And so there are many functions, there are called 20 emergency services functions, and many subjects played into different functions. For example, flood mapping, which is what I was involved with, uh, plays into uh, rescue, urban search and rescue. It plays into recovery. Uh, where, where did the water go? How deep was the flow? So if you think about this, we start off just with data. And in, in the case, what I was dealing with, the data was coming from the national water model about forecasting how, how deep the water is. So we were just getting files, numbers. We weren't any maps at all. We were then creating maps individually for individual periods of the storm, or in case of the, um, what we were doing actually was taking the forecast and looking at along the forecast and picking the highest point. So we actually produced not a whole series of maps, but just like the worst that we can imagine is going to happen. So we produced these maps. Um, and then they needed to be integrated with other things. And as, we sh as I'll show you as we go along, we had address points for where people are living in Texas. We overlaid the uh, inundation maps with the address points to find out how many people were impacted in different places. And then that's used for sharing and collaboration. How, you know, how many rescue points? You know, airplanes to here, helicopters there, high occupancy vehicles over there. Sorry, nothing for you right now. And you know, the pressure was tremendous. I, I, and it was really interesting to see this whole process sort of working in real time. Um, and when you have a crisis like that, you, you have to have information from all over the place to make sense. And the sharing and collaboration, which is at the top here, you often, you often say, oh, you know, so, so what, you know, sharing and collaboration. Yeah, well, no, you really see it. <laughs> when you've got so many, you know, you've got 16,000 people in the, in the Texas National Guard that are being deployed. There's just lots and lots of decisions that have to be made under great pressure. Now, this is a slide on the, that I presented uh, last time, which is the idea of dividing uh, information into themes. Well, how do you think this idea of themes originally came about? Where did themes come from? Does anybody know how multicolor printing well, used to be done for maps? And you want to print blue and green and red and all that. How do you do that? Screen printing? Yes. Yes, yes. So basically, each color was printed separately. So uh, I did a, a, um, a genealogical chart for my mother's family, and I had uh, four colors on it, black, red, green, and blue, and the paper went through the presses four times. And I produced a master, which was actually in black with all the colors on it, uh, and except I was in black. And then I said, okay, these ones are all blue, and they just put a cover over it and cut a hole for every part that was blue, and then ran it through the press. And the same for green, and the same for red. Same for black. That's why sometimes when you see newspapers, they're kind of blurry. It's because the, the different colors didn't get printed correctly. The registration of the paper wasn't correct. 
But that's how maps were always prepared. And so the blue stuff, which was water, was kept separate. And the green stuff, which was forest, is separate. And the brown stuff, which is roads, is another layer. And black photography or something is different. And so they were all printed in different layers. And so this idea of themes really came out of this concept of separating layers of information when maps were printed. But it's a fundamental idea um, of GIS. What's, this, what's the weakness of this system? Yes? One cover the other? Perhaps? Yes. Yes, they do. Well, they're sort of co-registered, you could say. Yes, they may not match up perfectly. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good point. Sometimes they don't. Like for example, hydrographic points for gauging stations might not be right on the line that represents a stream. But hey, the stream's not a line anyway. It's just it's a wide thing, right? So we're assuming something of zero width is equivalent to something that really has some width. What else is a weakness of this system? Can be too much data. This is actually one of the reasons why. It's divided into themes, as you see here, so to sort of simplify things, right? To sort of sort out things into packages that like becomes like. I think that's actually quite a good system for that. Any other thoughts? Each of the theme layers has to be the same size. Not necessarily. They can be of different scopes, but you have to have coverage over the area that you're interested in for a project. So next in the next exercise two, what you're going to do is actually pick out an area and clip out pieces of the data just for that area. Now, the, da the data that you're choosing from can be you know, as extensive as you like, but the piece that you end up with has to be uniform or covered. Yes? What about data management? Data management. Like, tell me about data management. So what's... You have to keep it on. Okay, so one, one of the key things about ArcGIS Pro that I think makes it better than ArcMap and Catalog and Toolbox is that every ArcGIS Pro is organized around a project and it has a database and you put all the stuff there so it's kind of like you know where it is you can sort of zip up the folder that it's in and you've got everything at hand so that's one of the good points about that any other thoughts Utah have you got any thoughts from Utah what the weaknesses of the system are any thoughts guys can it skew the data when you convert to different projections what was that did you hear that no not really speak up to the Will it skew um, the maps when you convert to different projections? Yes, yeah, so the, the, it's true that you can have different data sets in different projections, and that can be a problem. And the ArcGIS software is clever enough that it knows, even when it's looking at data at different projections, it registers so it looks the same. Actually, what happens is it's in a layout which has a fixed projection, and all the data is registered so that it looks the same. But really, to get the processing functions to work, you've got to have consistent coordinate systems across the data sets, and that's an important piece, actually. Yes? Sir, it ignores the interdependence among variants. Okay, yes. That's the point I wanted to draw out here. It ignores the interdependence among the themes. So we've taken this complicated world and we've separated it out into pieces. But really, that gauging station is associated with that particular stream reach, which has this particular channel that has that cross-section on it. And so this kind of neighborliness of things, of across different kinds of things, it gets, is a, it gets lost or, or can get lost. And so um, that's something of a weakness of this system, I would say. Dr. Tarleton, do you have any thoughts? Um, no, I think that's uh, probably got it covered. Yeah. So, <clears throat> we're going to begin with the idea of vector data. Now, uh, we have vector data and we have raster data. Dr. Tabaton likes to say vector is correcter and raster is faster, so uh, it's <laughs> one way of distinguishing it. Uh, why vector? Uh, what's a vector? Something that has magnitude and direction, right. So, and the contrast to that is a scalar, something that only has magnitude. So vector has magnitude and direction. So vector data, for example, point x1, y1, is actually some point out in space, but you can imagine that there's a vector that's drawn from 0, 0 to x1, y1. So in other words, even though it's just a point, in effect it defines a vector. 
Similarly, if we have a sequence of points, you can think of them as a set, as a sequence of vectors, and a polygon is a closed set of lines, like this. Um, and the polygon is an area. What's a famous polygon? A hexagon, yes, that's true. Hexagons are very good space-dividing uh, polygons. They're What's a famous polygon in, Wa in Washington? Pentagon. The Pentagon. Yes, who's been in the Pentagon? I've been in the Pentagon, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting place, yeah. They have um, five sides, and it has rings, and it has levels. So you're actually in a three-dimensional coordinate system. You locate yourself which ring you're in, which uh, of the five sides you're on, and which level you're on. That's how officers are identified in the Pentagon. Um, I went in in the old days when security wasn't like it is now, so... You could just kind of walk in with somebody that you knew. Um, this is a layout from a project that I was involved with quite a long time ago in the South Florida called the Kissimmee River. And the, the South Florida Water Management District has its uh, area, its drainage area, divided into uh, small um, control units, they're called. Each of these actually has a control gate at one end or the other. It's a really interesting place, South Florida, where water gets pumped around in a big way. Um, and you can see here the Kissimmee River, which runs from uh, Lake Kissimmee to Lake Okeechobee. Mm -hmm. This is the top part of that. And there's actually two paths here. Uh, in the old days, it, they had a wandering path. And then we decided, in good engineering, we're going to straighten this thing out. It's going to reduce flooding. And then a few decades later, we decided, oh, bad idea. So now we've gone, it's now a wandering path again. So, hey, keeps everybody employed. I'm sure it's a great idea. Anyway, it was pretty successful too, actually, the restoration of the Kissimmee River. Um, and these are the different themes that are used to describe this area. Water bodies for... Sorry, were you going to say something? Okay. Water bodies, uh, drainage areas, uh, stage height stations, and so on. And every one of these objects has associated with it an attribute table uh, and, a, and a row and an attribute table. So in this case, this is a feature class that I've outlined in blue here called watersheds. Uh, this is, happens to be the S65A watershed. Um, S65B is just downstream if you are interested. And associated with that are a whole series of attributes, areas, shape, length, and many, many other things if necessary that describe this particular thing, this watershed. Now, what makes ArcGIS different than, than <laughs> thank you, what makes ArcGIS different than a drawing system is a drawing system can do this. It can describe maps. It can have digital maps on it. A database system can do this. It can have tables. But a GIS has a one-to-one -one association between spatial features and records in a data table. And that's what makes GIS different from databases and from digital mapping systems. So sort of the key thing, key innovation that separated GIS out from the pack. And we're going to make a lot of use in this class of the idea of the interoperability of raster data and vector data. And we're going to say that raster data or gridded data, uh, a point is just one cell, a line is a sequence of cells, not necessarily in a straight line as you see here, and a polygon is a zone of cells, which is not necessarily in a um, rectangular shape uh, as you see here. Um, and in raster data, the cells are always square, but the combination of them doesn't have to be square. So we can have discrete descriptions of things, and we can have continuous descriptions of things. And the sort of interplay of one and the other is uh, something that we're going to think and work on a lot during the semester. Um, this is a slide actually Dr. Tarleton made up. Do you want to speak to this one, David? Uh, sure. So um, this was really uh, intended to... Um, illustrate that uh, there's, the, there's two uh, ways of representing things. One is the uh, sort of discrete objects, point lines, polygons. The other is the field, uh, which would cover a sort of a spatial surface. And uh, typically the discrete objects, well, a discrete object is uh, a thing like a house or a building or a road that has a limited extent. A field is a quantity that uh, covers the entire space and is described by the value at a specific location. And uh, so those are sort of different ways of describing the world, if you will. You can describe the world as there's these things here and there, or the value of it is, uh, is that. And uh, 
rasters are typically better for describing uh, fields, whereas uh, uh, vectors, uh, points, lines, and polygons are better for describing objects. Although you can sort of uh, cram the one into the other. For example, with a field, you can say, oh, you're in the house or you're out of the house. So that gives you a, a representation um, of something discrete with a field representation. During Harvey, the precipitation was a field. I mean, it's a, it's a map, right? It's a continuous map. And in fact, it's not just a function of x and y. It's a function of x, y, and t. So fields can be multidimensional. And there is within ArcGIS a, a concept called <coughs> multidimensional fields that's important in large-scale water resources work. When we were doing the flooding, we were looking at the stream reaches across all of the impacted area of Harvey and their variation through time. So that was another idea of a field actually expressed on features as the spatial representation, but still having um, an index for the, the features to, index, uh, to show which one you're meaning and having them as a function of time. Yes? In the field, yes. Uh, does each cell have a specific point, point or is it also continuous on the cell and so, so the question is, in, this, in the field, does each cell have a specific point? Ah, so Dr. Tarbertin, that's a good question for you. In the field, does each cell <laughs> represent a specific point? Um, so there's different interpretations that uh, you can place on it. So if you think of a representing a field as, uh, as a grid, which is a, a square of a certain area, there's uh, alternative interpretations. You could interpret that value as the value at the center. Uh, say, for example, if it was elevation, uh, you might put a some measuring device a staff down and measure the elevation at the center. You can interpret it as an average over that, uh, that cell, um, where you're thinking of now the cell has a certain sort of footprint and perhaps it's the average value. Or there's also interpretations where you have it at one of the corner values. And um, we will either be working with it as uh, the value at the center or the um, some sort of an average over a certain footprint. And that gets into the question of um, what's the scale associated with the measurement that we'll talk a little bit about later. Because if you measure anything, typically there's a, uh, a scale associated with, uh, with that measurement, the graininess of a photo, if you will, or when you uh, measure um, a quantity, the sort of average of space over which you're uh, measuring that, uh, that quantity. Any other questions? So this is uh, a really wonderful uh, field uh, that has been kept in a GIS as a raster that's really been profoundly um, informative. This is a shuttle radar topography mission that was flown in 2000. So the shuttle went over the Earth, and out of, one, out of the bay of the shuttle, there was a radar sending images down, and on an arm there was another one. So it was like two eyes. And it passed over the Earth for 12 days and it produced an elevation surface for the entire Earth in 12 days <laughs> at 90 meter resolution for um, public display and 30 meters for military. Now the 30 meter data are actually being released. But this was the first highly detailed topographic coverage of the Earth that was ever produced. And this is the area near Santa Barbara, California, for those who know, drive up the coast there and you know, you're doing your California thing and <laughs> getting mellow in Santa Barbara and all that wonderful place. <laughs> uh, and you can see the mountains in behind. And so this, you can imagine the, the plethora of applications that resulted from the SRTM data, including the capacity to delineate drainage areas and stream networks anywhere in the world that was covered by the SRTM. Uh, this is an interesting slide that Dr. Tarbertin also uh, made up. Do you want to commentate on this one, David? Sure. So this um, uh, just gives a bit of a history of uh, working with uh, digital elevation data and uh, shows the challenge that's faced uh, as we uh, get better and better data. So uh, when I started working on this uh, in the late 1980s, the best data we could get came from the Defense Mapping Agency and was in a 90 meter grid size, but then we've sort of progressed to uh, USGS digital elevation models that are widely used in the US at 30 meters. Now uh, you can get a 10 meter digital elevation model anywhere in the US, and we're rapidly moving to where you can get uh, 
without our data at one meter resolution or, or even smaller. So if you think of a 50,000 uh, square kilometer watershed, and I picked that size because that's the size of the Bear River that drains into the Great Salt Lake, roughly uh, 27 megabytes, uh, not very much uh, on a computer, but if it goes up to 200 gigabytes, it's starting to uh, consume a rather large fraction of your hard drive. And that's, that's something of a challenge for us now. So this year and last year, two-thirds of Texas was mapped for LIDAR about, at a cost of about $40 million. And the data are now flowing in. So we've now got a much more detailed representation of 180,000 square miles of the state. 270,000 is the total. So two-thirds of the area was mapped like this in the last year. It takes about a year for the data to come actually be processed and come out. We're getting nearly overwhelmed by this these data here. So, this, so the, really the challenge for us as we try to move forward and get more accurate floodplain mapping is how to deal with this density. Just moving the files around is a problem for a large area. Um, and so this is really a challenge. I mean, at one level you say, oh yes, we want better data. And of course we want better data. What we found is that better data is heavy, hard to carry around, and also this Lots of detail. There's an infinite amount of detail. Every stream hits a road, and the road has got a bridge on it. It looks like it's a dam, but oh no, it's not a dam. It's just a bridge. I mean, oh yeah, all kinds of complications. So these are some of the challenges that we've dealt with through the years. I started with this level of data, 90 meter data. And uh, when, when we were delineating drainage areas from that, we could only get them accurate to about 5%. We moved to 30 meter data, and the accuracy went down to a half a percent. With 5% data, we couldn't convince the engineering profession this was a good method. Half a percent, they said, forget it. <laughs> it's good enough, yeah. And they, everyone switched to the digital mode of doing things. So there's a certain criterion of you know, how accurate can things be before they become acceptable for use also. Now, we're going to use this tool uh, or subsystem of ArcGIS actually called Spatial Analyst um, to uh, analyze uh, topographic data and other forms of continuously varying raster information. And this is going to, we're going to use this for two um, exercises, perhaps even for three. For three, four, and five, we're going to use versions of the, or the spatial analyst tools for analyzing surface terrain and the interrelationships on it. And as I mentioned before, uh, grids or rasters are square, square cells of equal size. There's no rectangles here for the cells. However, there can be for the number of columns and the number of rows. And you may say, well, you know, my area is a bit kind of a, uh, an odd-looking an oddball looking area. When you have oddball looking areas, what you do is actually assign some cells like no data. There's nothing here. And that's the way you get kind of odd areas within what is here a rectangular domain. Uh, you can have lots, all different kinds of gridded uh, information or gridded data sets. Uh, this one happens to be the runoff curve number. For those who are hydrologists will know this. That's a number between 0 and 100 that tells you something about the capacity of rainfall to produce runoff. Another kind of continuous information that's not, um, that's somewhat different is called image data sets. And image data sets are different because they have just as, uh, they're just from 0 to 255. They def define the, the degree of intensity of a particular color. So you can have green, red, orange, you can have black and white image data sets. Image data sets uh, have integer values. The integer value is sort of an index of something. It's not a real number like what a grid is. So there's two different kinds of continuous data that we're going to work with. And so the question becomes, how do we put all this together? We've got terrain, we have little drainage areas, we have streams, we have water bodies. And what we're really trying to say is to sort of restore all the neighborliness again and say, oh, I'm going to put this together and now I really know what's going on. This stream goes into the top end of the lake and that one's a tributary down there. And this is the drainage area that comes into this. And this is what the national water model uses for the whole country. <coughs> this is a layout like this. Okay, so I presented this slide uh, last time. Um, actually, Dr. Tabberton recommended it, and I hadn't appreciated the importance of it until I started thinking about it quite a bit. But these views, geovisualization, geodatabase, and geoprocessing, uh, you're going to be doing all of these things as you go along this semester. You're going to be working a lot with geodatabases, although somewhat out of the, sort of off to the side, because that's organized within the ArcGIS project. 
Um, you're doing lots of geoprocessing, and you're going, it'll be right in your face, you'll see that, and then you're going to interpret the result with the maps. And these systems themselves always existed, but in different forms. And I thought it might be useful just to look, just to describe a little bit of the history of this, because the first representation of all of this was called ARC Info. And the ARC stood for the spatial stuff, and the Info was a, re was a relational database. Actually, Jack Daner bought a company called Info, and he put the two things together. And that's how Esri first really got going. Um, in New Zealand, we were developing something at that time called uh, LADIDA, Land Development Data. So I was working in a natural resources organization, and we had people working 24 hours a day digitizing the land cover and slope and soils of New Zealand. And the idea was to estimate how, what was the potential of the land to do different things. And so we had what we called microcomputers, and there were people digitizing, digitizing day and night, day and night. And, but every polygon, they digitized around this way, then they digitized around that way. So they had to make sure the lines are all lined up. And when you think, oh, you know, lots of extra work was done there, and then the lines had to be checked, and then it was a bit crazy. After seven years of working on lighting data, they said, uh-oh, forget it. <laughs> we'll just we'll buy the system from America. <laughs> We're not going to try and fight this anymore. Um, <clears throat> so that was the first idea. And it had the idea of a coverage, and the key idea of coverage was that uh, points, uh, points, points linked in a sequence become lines, and lines linked in a sequence produce polygons. And that was a sort of topologically tight description. And it had a macro language called ARC macro language. I used to be an ARC AML program. I used to meet people and say, oh, I'm an, I'm an AML program, and they're proud of it too. And you just put the sort of functions in line. I could even do it myself, actually. I liked it. Um, <coughs> which, so for 10 years or so, 20 years actually, this was really the only system. Then in the 1990s, the Windows operating system became popular. And that had a visual interface, and nobody wanted to work with command lines anymore. It was kind of boring, Unix, who needs that? So then ArcView, which is a uh, visual interface version, became available, and it carried with it a new form for describing data called the shapefile. And the shapefile has persisted ever since, even though the software has changed dramatically. This is an open file format that's <coughs> become a standard in the GIS industry for moving data around. And it derived from this software called ArcView. And then had another scripting language, which Esri built for itself, called Avenue. Then in about 2000, or actually 1998, Esri decided to junk everything. So now, you imagine this, you know, you're the market leader, you decide to kill everything that you've done and start all over again. Yeah, the, Jack told me that he, he bet the farm on that decision, the entire business, and it worked. And they had to start all over again. I mean, the pressure was tremendous. And the idea was to say, this is not something that's different than everything else. This is something, it's just another form of data. And we want to be able to work with regular, regularly defined databases that are used for other kinds of data manipulations <coughs> and just adapt them for what we do instead of trying to be something completely different. So version 8 and then onwards uh, was the software that we used then. It had a uh, visual interface, with the, which was called ArcInfo. Uh, sorry, ArcInfo. <laughs> So for a number of years, we used that. Now, that was developed on the Microsoft Objects library, like Excel. It was very much like Excel and had used Visual Basic for um, scripting. And then later, they decided they didn't want to use a sort of a custom language for that, so they switched to Python for scripting. And then most recently, they've switched <coughs> to this new system, ArcGIS Pro. And the reason is that um, ArcMap is really kind of a 2000s-era system, and it was it's sort of defined by the era in which it was created. And it's for 32-bit architectures on computers, and most computers now have 64-bit architectures for defining um, a single number or um, element. And so in 2016, we switched to this system, ArcGIS Pro, even though the ArcMap system is still um, widely used. Dr. Tarleton, do you want to add anything to that history? Um. I think not, except maybe you just want to point out the, the versioning number that you've got under ArcGIS actually applies to the desktop or ArcMap, and the Pro, they started again from one. Okay. So we're at now two uh, in, the, in the Pro versioning. Okay, that's a, good, that's a good point. So ArcMap, the current version is actually 10.6, although we've got 10.5 loaded here at UT, and the Pro starts off at 1.0 and so on, and now we're at 2.2, which is the version that we're, we're using in this class. So under the version that we've been using of ArcGIS until 2015, in which 
many people still use, the geoprocess, <laughs> geovisualization, and geodatabase functions respectively are represented by ArcMap, which is the interface that you see open here, and then a little tab at the side which exposes this set of folders here, which is sort of like Windows Explorer, which is Arc Catalog, and then a separate system, Arc Toolbox, which has lists of tools within each of these little red toolbox things. And these are three separate things, really. They're in, you can access them all from one interface, but the reality is it's sort of three separate systems. And you know, we went along for years and used it. In fact, I taught a class last spring in New Zealand. They hadn't changed at the university there to Arc uh, GIS Pro, so I taught out of Arc Map, and it works okay. Um, however, what you're going to work with, I think, is a better system. It took a bit for us to convert ourselves into ArcGIS Pro, but once you, once you sort of, once you go pro, you don't go back. You know, that's the idea. <laughs> it's like, yes, you know, I've drunk the Kool-Aid. Um, <laughs> and again, you have geoprocessing, you have geovisualization, which is the map, um, and you have a database behind this and a geoprocessing window that you see here, also windows uh, for other functionings for other functions such as symbology and labeling and other things that we'll run into next time. Underneath all of this, there's a fixed structure for a project which has an index, which is this blue folder that you see here, <coughs> an ArcGIS project file. And this bridgerails.ddb is the geodatabase. So you've got an index file that links up all the um, information and causes it to color in correctly. I've got a set of tools, ridge rails that's associated with this. Um, and so this folder then becomes the repository for your whole project. And it's really helpful to have that because it's not like three separate systems. Everything is in, inside a single system. Another thing that's come about in both ArcGIS and ArcGIS Pro is the idea that you can have ready-to-use tools for anywhere in the world. And I mentioned this in class last time. While I was preparing for this class uh, last night, I decided I would just delineate the drainage area of Waller Creek at the University of Texas at Austin. So if you walk out this building and look over the, behind the trees, you'll find there's a creek there. And, oh, I want to get a feel for, you know, where the water comes from. Well, it comes from above 2222, in fact, almost up to um, Anderson uh, Lane. Well, almost up to 183, actually. You can see the north end here. And so this represents the drainage area um, of Waller Creek. Actually, and if you go out along the street here, which is Dean Keaton Street, and you walk up the hill, you get to the point where you're actually at the edge of this drainage area, and the, on the other side, it flows to another creek called Shoal Creek. So actually, right here, inside the campus, we've got a drainage divide, and if you just walk up the hill, you'll see it. And on our side, the water's running down the hill towards Waller Creek, and on the other side, it flows towards Shoal Creek. So this idea of having a point that's an, on a creek and then a drainage area around it. It's really fundamental to this class, and these ready-to-use functions mean that you can do this anywhere. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're in New Guinea or New Zealand or Newfoundland or wherever, wherever new place you're at. <laughs> so you, you might want to add that that's taking advantage of things like the shuttle radar topography yes. that uh, is in, as we has put it, in the cloud and it's part of the movement of, well, one of the ways of dealing with the overwhelming data is effectively to have cloud <laughs> systems that allow it to be stored only in a few locations and we act on them rather than everybody having to download the data to their local disk and do the sort of processing. So the services that process in the cloud that, uh, that enable that, and uh, ArcGIS Pro has become much more cloud enabled than uh, previous systems were. Yeah, yeah. So in previous versions of this class, we used to download digital elevation models and agonize over that for a while, but now, you know, you're on easy street and you can take a nap and uh, play on your phone a little bit or something like that. Play Minecraft. <laughs> My grandson's totally into Minecraft, you know. I can understand it, you know, this fascination of building square buildings and destroying square buildings. I mean, that's... Fascinating. I guess, it, I mean, for engineers it probably is, but I can't understand it. Who's into Minecraft? Anybody into Minecraft? No? Okay, must be lower, you know, the, the next version of Gen X or something. <laughs> yeah, they're totally into Minecraft, I know that. Um, so, 
We've got this thing called a geo database. I'm going to go into some detail as to describe, you know, what is the meaning of the term geo database. Inside of ArcGIS Pro, there's some help which talks about geo databases in general. Actually, I like the previous help better than this. It's mostly about text. It doesn't have as nice of pictures as they used to have. But key to this are three kinds of information that we're going to use a lot. Um, tables, which are collections of rows containing the same fields. Feature classes, which are tables with a shape field added to them that contain the geometries for points, lines, and polygons. And then raster data sets for satellite and aerial imagery and other cell-based data sets. These are the main things that we're going to be working on in the geodatabase. Now, there are other things that you can have there as well, such as tools. You can have uh, relationships so that this you can actually store this thing is connected to that thing in this way, so that you bring the um, association of these things together. You can have networks. Uh, you can have uh, annotation layers. So in a more elevated system, you can actually have quite a few other things. And this is a geodatabase that we made up quite a long time ago, actually, for the Lower Colorado River Authority. And it had uh, channels, uh, drainage areas for watersheds, hydrography. Each of this, this little tank here, the cylinder is the geodatabase. These are called feature data sets, and they all are defined to have a common coordinate system so that <laughs> the data can be properly manipulated. Um, you can have relationships that are embedded in that, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. And uh, you can have object classes, you can have geometric networks, which are lines which have a direction embedded in them. You can have just feature classes, which are uh, sets of points, lines, and areas. And all those things can be inside of one package, which is really quite helpful because then you don't have to look around for everything. So an object class is a set of objects in a tabular format that have the same behavior and attributes. And in this instance, this class is a set of um, values for water quality criteria. So in this case, the parameter is uh, 0010, 0095, in this case 00310, like bio biochemical oxygen demand, uh, bacterial content, oxygen, I mean, many other kinds of things you can deal with in water quality. So there's a unique identifier here, which is the parameter uh, that you see. And there's also one that you'll see in a moment that becomes important is the watershed that's being dealt with. So in this instance, we're going to have a feature class, which is a set of geographic objects in tabular format that have the same attributes, uh, but they have this additional thing called a shape. So hanging on the front here is this thing, shape. You don't see the inside of that. It just tells you where the values are. And so a feature class is an object class with one more field that has shape. And then we've got um, ArcGIS Online, which becomes uh, mapping on the web uh, to supply additional information. So here, this is the splash screen for ArcGIS Online. And in here at UT Austin, we are part of the UT Austin organizational group for ArcGIS Online. And similarly, the students at Utah State University are part of the Utah State University organizational group. And this gallery for UT Austin, or University of Texas at Austin, shows maps that have been done by different people and departments in the campus and have been published within our um, organizational account. This one down here actually is a map of our um, address points for the state that we collected. Uh, but these other maps have been created by other people. This one here is actually the Brazos Water Operations Model. It was developed at our Center for Research in Water Resources. So, the idea of an organizational group is that you can share information amongst your group without necessarily making it public with everyone else. Um, ArcGIS Online gives you the opportunity to make a map actually without using any software at all. You can actually do, do it completely on the web. So you can choose a base map and then add things to the base map. Now, we're not going to emphasize this in this class because we have the software, so we don't need to just have the limitations that are involved in a web-based system for making maps, but you can do that. And also in ArcGIS Online, there's this thing called the Living Atlas. And this is a uh, uh, fantastic uh, agglomeration of all kinds of information. So let's go and take a look at what we can do in the Living Atlas.
so you can sign in. So I'm going to sign myself in. Okay, so uh, there's all kinds of um, content that you can see here. So you can browse like this. And there's a series of uh, themes, world demographics, for example. I want to I understand something about population distribution across the world. World topographic map, um, world street map, world imagery. Um, so, and there's a thing here that says all content types. Uh, you can have maps, layers, which are maps with attribution and so on. Scenes, this is 3D. You can actually do 2D and 3D things in um, ArcGIS Online. Uh, and then apps and story maps, which is a separate story that I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. But story maps are a sort of more sophisticated uh, version uh, that has, has maps and also um, other images and tables and narratives and so on associated with it. So here are some generalized maps that you can see. World Traffic Service, uh, terrain, for example, uh, multi-resolution world imagery information, world transportation. Uh, here's one called NAEP. Who knows what NAEP is? Tell us about NAEP. Yes, so, this, so the Department of Agriculture um, flies the, the nation each year. And, that's, and the, what they do is they are doing a very precise description of what's going on in the natural environment, primarily because uh, the Farm Bill, USDA Farm Bill, um, gives out money for farmers doing things, and you know, they don't want them to be doing other things. And so they've got to measure what is actually happening. So this USA National Agricultural Imagery Program has provided uh, a sort of a regularly updated uh, continental scale coverage of the nations, one of the most, uh, um, well, most regularly updated system, systems that exist. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not sure this is something from the Netherlands. Hey, Martin, what, what is this? Where's Martin? Over here. Okay, so what, do we, what does this say, Martin? Uh, it actually shows, well, the neighborhood uh, divided for a municipality. Okay, so this is the, basically the political subdivision of the Netherlands, is that right? Yeah. Mm. No? <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily political. Okay. So anyway, this is a, a map that would be useful if you're, um, you, know, you want to have um, detailed information. Active hurricanes. Okay, what's going on hurricane-wise? I think, yeah, we've got, a, uh, we've got something going on. Okay, so I'm going to log myself in. So you do. I use Maybrand 1840 because 1840 was the year New Zealand became a colony of Great Britain. <laughs> okay, whoa. Okay, so let's check out. Are we going to get creamed here? Uh, so this is Gordon, I guess. Yeah, so, whoops, doesn't look like we're going to get creamed, but whoops, we, don't, we wouldn't want to be in Louisiana. So looks like Gordon is heading up their way. Um, and I guess this is not the only uh, hurricane that's going on. There's this one here that passed over the Hawaiian Islands uh, recently. Yeah, so here, I guess it just um, passed just to the north. So here's the Hawaiian Islands, and here's the hurricane that passed near there. And so you can see this um, active hurricanes layer, just, uh, just something that Esri's put up there. But instead of having to go look at all over the place, you can find, oh, I can go and get the active hurricanes. Uh, this one here, USA forest type. Uh, so this is basically a forest map of uh, information for across the United States. Whoa. Okay, so I guess we've got forests. What sort of forests have we got here? So you can yeah look at different kind. You can see Texas has quite a bit of forest associated with it, actually, more than what you would think. Um, 
So, yeah. So here's the description of the different forest types of the nation and the definition of what they are. So what happens if we go down to green? What have we got? Mangroves. Well, I don't think we've got too many mangroves here. Well, some kind of green or blue. Is, this is pine forest down here. So what else do we have here? Multi-directional hill shade. So let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Dr. Tuberton, do you want to talk about a hill shade, what a hill shade involves? Sure. So um, if you think of a digital elevation model as just giving uh, elevation values at uh, various uh, different grid cells, um, one way to uh, visualize that is just with a color scheme that goes from sort of dark to light um, for low elevation to high elevation or something like that. But that's not uh, very um, sort of intuitive if you look at it. Hill shade is if you take, a, take the sun and you would shine on it and uh, depending on the, the angle of uh, incidence, it, uh, it would sort of highlight it light or dark. And uh, when you look at it visually, you can actually see uh, the topography as we're used to seeing it when we uh, sort of walk around outside. So um, in this particular one we're looking at, we're seeing some interesting uh, canyons coming out of a mountain range and then it looks like a deep canyon uh, uh, sort of in the middle to the left. Um, so let's so find hill is a useful way to visualize topography. So let's say, hey, let's suppose we want to find some additional things. So it looks like there should be some, uh, there should be some streams here. So if we just look up hydrography, um, World Hydrographic Map, let's see. Oops, no, oh, that's not what I want there. I'm searching there for... You might want to try something more native like rivers. Uh, I'll try a simpler word. Hydrography is a very geeky term. No, I, I just ser <laughs> I searched in the wrong place. What I, when I searched over there, I was searching for an object in this particular map. And when I search here, I'm searching for themes and other elsewhere in the Living Atlas. So let's suppose we've got here USA detailed streams. Um, oh, that's a USA National Hydrography data set. Let's add that to the map. So now, whoops. So now, let me use that. You seem to be zoomed in here. You're in Canada. I'm in, ah. <laughs> so maybe I am. That's interesting. Well, that's, it says at the bottom. Okay, well, let's, let's come to some place in America and see what happens. So it'll take a while. Well, this is a detailed uh, layout, so it takes a while for that to show up. Yeah, there we are. So there we are. So there's a, there's a little, you can see the much more detailed uh, hydrography of streams here now. Maybe we want to add land cover or something like that. So we can look at the, uh, this and let's say we just put land cover here. US National Land Cover 2011. So let's suppose we want to add land cover. And here's land cover. Oh, totally cool, huh? Yeah, so this is just as simple as that. You can, you can just go someplace, actually without any software, but you can do this from, from within the ArcGIS software also, and you can start building yourself a map and start learning, oh gosh, I can see uh, you know, what's, what's going on here. Let's, maybe let's try something else. Let's try demography. Demographics of India. <laughs> well, I guess we don't want demographics of India. Life expectancy by country. Okay, so let me be a little bit more specific. Let's say population. U.S. daytime population. There we are. It's What's the difference between a daytime and a nighttime population? Um, <laughs> so that's an interesting question. So um, USA daytime population is not responding. There you go, still trying. So that's an interesting question. Um, and, and a pretty important question too, actually. So if you imagine Austin, it matters a lot whether it's the day or the night where people are, right? I drove 12 miles to get here this morning. So if we have a disaster in the middle of the day, the daytime population and the nighttime population can be very different. 
and that matters for emergency response and lots of other things. So sometimes you get this kind of response. USA daytime population cannot be, um, cannot be recovered. So um, let me just put census here and see what happens. Sometimes when you're housing demographics, race demographics, census has an amazing, um, let's just put this one here, USA topographic tracts. So this is how people information is uh, laid out in the nation on these uh, US uh, census tracts. There's about, uh, not responding, okay, there you go, still trying. Um, Oh, let me, I'll just pass on from that. But, um, but anyway, you can see that there's lots of information that's accessible here through um, RGIS Living Atlas. And uh, some of it you know, works well. Probably the services that every supports work well. Some of the others don't, don't work so well. Um, I, I, think, I think part of the problem might be because uh, you're working on a computer that's slow and you're connected to the network uh, sharing video. Um, Okay. Because I think a lot of this processing actually happens uh, sort of in the browser. And uh, I've found that when I'm trying to do something over, a, over the web, when you're doing a video conference, it's, it's much slower than when you're not. Mm. Okay, thank you for that uh, guidance. In any case, I think you can, you can get the sense of you can search for additional information here, you can lay it over. I mean, you can start building maps and that without having to go. And the difference between this system and what we used to use is that you had to search through piles of websites to find things in the past, and lots of that isn't necessary anymore. Okay, so let's go on from this. Um, and I want to talk a little bit now about story maps. And this happens to be a story map that was done for Hurricane Harvey, actually by the National Association of Public Safety GIS people. So they built this map, or this story, it's called a story map, and this is really a map application. And this is photographs of Hurricane Harvey. And you're right, David, because this, when I do this on my home computer, it shows up almost instantaneously. So it's taking a while to kind of breathe here to um, establish the connection with this. But a story map, um, is a, is a more complex thing than simple map, and it has a story associated with it. Something went wrong. The story could not find or load the crowdsource load map layer accurately. Well, that's tedious, isn't it? So this this probably a more uh, uh, significant limitation than I realized. Anyway, if you do this at home, you'll be able to... Well, if you uh, disconnect it from the guitar, you'd be fine to do it, but then we wouldn't see it, so... I, I beg that. I'm sorry, Dave. Oh, if you disconnect it, yeah, nobody... If you, would, if you, you know, disconnect it from Utah, then it'd be fine. Ah. The problem is the bandwidth of the, of the, of the sharing of the desktop that's, that's okay. consuming. Okay, so we've got a few. Anyway, there's lots and lots of really cool stuff in here. So when you're starting to do your project, I mean, a good place to begin searching for information is just to search in the, in the Living Atlas here because there's probably a lot of things, some of them general comp, uh, coverages that ESRI puts out and others that are, um, that are put out um, by other organizations that you can, for example... Uh, Oh, there we go. Esri NL content. I guess this comes from Esri Never. CBS, like the Burkhardt. What does this mean, Martin? Is this? Uh, it is from the, the Central Bureau of Statistics. And it is actually a, an even more local map. Okay, so this is published by the Central Bureau of Statistics of the Netherlands. So the, these are thousands of organizations that have published maps. And the idea is that this is sort of a big, uh, mushed up map sharing system. Human geography based map. Okay, human geography information. Slope map, all kinds of weather warnings and watches. I guess, topo bathroom. Okay, so um, I wanted to say a little bit about story maps because I think this is an area where you might have some interest uh, for your project. Oops, I can't. For some reason that's. Locked up. Control Alt Delete. Where's the delete? Hmm. Computer doesn't have a delete. <laughs> Control Alt Delete. There's got to be a delete here somewhere. Hmm. Wow. Oops. 
escape, no. I'm not sure how I, ah, clear, maybe control alt clear. I'm sorry, I can't, I'm kind of stymied here because I can't get out of this application. Control alt in, maybe. No, it's backspace. Hmm. Yeah, I've been having escape, but escape doesn't escape. <laughs> well, anyway, let me just explain what I was what I was wanting to um, describe here. So, uh, a story map is a good way to tell a story, and in fact, it can be there can be a substitute for PowerPoint. So, um, I've seen people using story maps in professional presentations as a way of presenting their project. Now, we present projects at the end of the semester. We've always used PowerPoint, but you know, if you want to really be cool. Uh, <laughs> you might think about using story map and, there, and a good reason for using story map is that it has zoomable maps in it. So instead of just having a fixed view like you know whatever it is that you captured for your PowerPoint slide, a story map can you can zoom in and you can see oh I want to see the photos or this area of Houston or something like that. Um, and uh, it also, this also um, admits a kind of a project that tells a story about a particular area. So lots of projects that we do in this class are analytically oriented. You know, you do analysis of this, analysis of this, analysis of something else. The story map's somewhat different, and it, the intent is, or can be somewhat different, and it can be just like what you see here. It's just to say, you know, here's a big picture of a hurricane and a flood that's hit a city, and I want to show you lots of photos of what's, what's happening there. And as a, generally in story maps, there's a sequence, and so you can go from one piece to the next, and, you, and in that sense, a story map can evolve and can be a little bit like um, uh, PowerPoint is when you're presenting it in, uh, in a sequenced form. So that was the last slide that I had to present. So since I'm stuck here, I guess this is <laughs> as far as I can go. <laughs> Are there any questions that you have? Dr. Tarbaton, do you have any thoughts? Um, not specifically. Did you guys have any questions or? Um. Okay, so why don't we declare victory um, and <laughs> and next uh, time we'll go on to uh, exercise one where you'll get to use ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online. Oh, oh where's the delete? <laughs> Yeah.